Where you go, I go. What you say, I say. What you pray, I pray. What you pray, I pray. Good afternoon. I've entitled this message, You Can Run From Your Sin, But You Cannot Hide From It. We're reading out of the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, verse 16. The word of God reads, Now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, that same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Yet, if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness, nor from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. This afternoon I want to share about a watchman, a watchman named Jonah, a watchman named Gabriel. There are many watchmen out there. We've been called to look over the house of God, to look over the streets, to look over different ministries that we've been called to. And Jonah in 1.1, 1, 1, it says that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittahi, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah was given three commands. One of them was to arise. In Hebrew, the word arise means just that, get up. But the word go means to turn in another direction, physically and emotionally. Many times we've called to go someplace, and we'll go physically, but emotionally we won't go. And that's what happened here with Jonah. Jonah had an issue with the people of Nineveh. He hated the people of Nineveh because they were Israel's enemy. And he did not want to share the, the gospel. He did not want to share God's word, God's salvation with them. So he wasn't emotionally prepared to go to Nineveh. And he did not want to cry out against it, speak to them or preach to them. And I remember myself when the Lord opened many doors for me. Many doors to go into different prisons and different churches. But there was a certain place that I didn't want to go to. Two of those places were the West Yard and the East Yard. Both of those yards had people on those yards that I didn't like. I didn't like informants. I didn't like child molesters. I didn't like baby killers and all the other people that were on those yards. I considered them weak individuals. And I didn't want to go there. And God was sending me there. And I was making up excuses why I couldn't go. And, and I was trying to avoid it in the same way that Jonah was trying to avoid Nineveh. And we look here in Jonah 1, 3, it says that Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, which was in Spain, 2,500 miles in another direction. He wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord. It says that he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. How many of you know that you can't run from God? Many have tried, and they found out that they can't. Jonah tried to run from God. In Hebrews 4.13 it says that there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Your actions, your thoughts, your slickest plans, there is nothing hidden from God. I don't care what you've done. You cannot hide from him. He is everywhere. In Jeremiah 23.24 it says, Can anyone hide himself in secret places? Those places that you think that nobody knows about. God knows about those places. He says, so that I shall not see him, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. He knows those things that we don't even want to testify about. The things that we're ashamed of. The things that we hope that never come out. He knows about those things. So there is nothing hidden from him. In Psalms 139, 1, it says, O oh Lord. You have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts from afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. 
and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue. But behold, O Lord, you know all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. There's no place that we can flee. You think you can go to the to your girlfriend's house, to your homeboy's house, or the connections pad. There is no place that you can hide from God. He will go there. If you're there, He will go there because He loves you. And He wants to bring you home. In Jonah 1.4, we find that this is the way that God brought Jonah from his hiding place. In Jonah 1.4, it says that the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. And there was a violent, windy storm on the ocean, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God. But nothing changed. On that ship were many people. And on that ship, they, different religions, different doctrines, different beliefs. Everybody had their own opinion of a God. Everyone was serving a different God. But when the violent storm hit, and they all started to cry out and, and asking their God to stop the storm. It said that nothing changed. Nothing ended. So they began to, to go into the areas of the boat and throw all the heavy stuff, all the cargo that was into the ship, and throw it into the sea to lighten the load. How many of you know that when a violent storm hits your life, all of a sudden you begin to start cleaning house? You start going and looking for the paraphernalia that you have hidden, the guns that you have hidden, the, the pictures and the letters and all the other stuff, the incriminating things that can send you to prison, you begin to clean house. It's just like when you're in prison and they say that the cops are coming, the guards are coming. All of a sudden you start flushing things and getting rid of stuff. It's the same thing in the streets. You start to clean house when a violent storm hits your life. You begin to examine yourself and start taking a look at yourself and starting to ask yourself, what is it that's wrong with me? What are the things that I need to fix? Because as you begin to examine your heart and in your mind and your life and your lifestyle, you begin to see those things that you need to get rid of. Those ungodly relationships, those evil associations, the phone number to the connections house, all that stuff you need to get rid of. These seasoned sailors that were on this boat, these tough guys, they, they were used to storms, but they ain't never seen a storm like this before. And it says in Jonah 1.14, it says that they all cried out to the Lord. They're no longer crying out to the God that they grew up knowing. Now they're crying out to Jonah's God, the God of Israel, the true God. And they said, we pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, and they threw him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared exceedingly, because now they saw the invisible hand of God made visible right before their eyes. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord and took vows. They, when they began to see the storm, a raging storm, a very violent storm, all of a sudden come to an end. They were believers. The minute that they saw everything become calm when they did what God wanted them to do. And that was to put Jonah back into that water. Send Jonah back where he came from in the direction that he was supposed to go. And it says that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. Now, it wasn't the devil that prepared this fish. It says that the Lord had prepared this fish. It was said that it was the Lord who prepared the police car. It wasn't the devil. Many times we start rebuking and binding the hand of God, not knowing that it is God that is behind the whole storm and the whole situation because he's dealing with a disobedient child that needs to be brought back to his senses again. I know many times I've saw myself in a prison cell. I saw myself in a police car, and I was always blaming everybody else. 
but I didn't know that it was God that was behind the whole situation. And you're probably asking yourself, what kind of God could do this to one of his own? A God that knows what's good for me and you. In Hebrews 12, 5, it says, My son, do not despise the punishment of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son whom he receives. If you, are, if you endure punishment, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? He has been disciplining me since 1983. I've been going astray. I've been trying to run from him. I, I, I cannot figure out what God wanted in my life. I did not look for God. I didn't want God, but God found me. And I'm thankful that God came looking for me because without him, I'd be going to hell. I'd be probably sitting in hell right now or doing life in prison with a lot of hate in my heart. But I thank God that he never left me. He's never cut me loose. He's never said, I don't want nothing to do with you. Like the prodigal son who comes home to the father. He, did the, he's, he was that loving father who was sitting on the porch waiting for me to come home. He didn't throw rocks at me and tell me to get off his property. He came running to me. He hugged me. He put a robe on me and sandals on my feet and a ring on my finger. And he killed the fatted calf and celebrated for once. His son was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. That's what God does. He's a loving father. He's not an angry God, but a loving God. And See, discipline will bring us back to our senses. So when God scourges you, when God punishes you, when God sits you in that cell for a little bit, don't get angry at God, but understand that God knows what he's doing. In Jonah 2.1, we see that this discipline brings Jonah back to his senses. It says that Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of the county jail I cried. And you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. And, into the, and, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows and all your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. What did this discipline do to Jonah? Did he start looking in other directions? No, he said, I'm, I got my focus again, Lord. I'm looking back where I left. I want to return back to the house of God. He says that the waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth was its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Why does our soul have to faint within us before we acknowledge God? I mean, why? I mean, when everything is going good and everything is happy and, and we don't have no relationship with him. But when we're going through stuff, when the hard times hit, when our souls faint, then we want to remember him. Then we want to cry out to him. We should be crying out to him every day, no matter what kind of day it is, good or bad. We should be crying out to him, hitting our knees in prayer, seeking him early in the morning, seeking him before we go to sleep, praising him throughout the day. And my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. And those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. But I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now, I don't know what Jonah vowed to God. But I know I vowed many times in my life. As I sat in them cells before. And as looking at life sentences. I've looked at a life sentence four times in my life. And every time. I've always cried out to him, get me out of this situation, God, and I'll go back to church. Get me out of this situation, and, and I'll quit doing drugs. Get me out, help me, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. Do you know what it is to make a vow to God? The word vow means to promise, to do, or to give something to God. I know many of times we've all done that. You've done it, I've done it, everybody's done it somewhere in their life. We're all a phone call away from God. That one phone call we get and we're like, God, if you just help them in that hospital room, I'll serve you. And he helps them, but you never come to him. 
We need to pay our vows. In Deuteronomy 23, 21, it says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it would be sin to you. In Ecclesiastes 5, 4, it says, When you make a vow to God, and, and, did, and not, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better to vow than to vow and not pay. This scripture was given to me one time when I asked God. I was house searching and I told God, if you give me this house, I'll quit smoking weed. Well, I got the house, but I didn't quit smoking weed. And one time I was working with my boss and he, he says, Gabriel, I have a, a word for you from God. I said, okay, what did he say? He says, it don't make no sense to me. He said, you made a promise to him about a house, and it's time to pay up. He wasn't there when I made my vow to God. He didn't hear this vow that I made to God. There was no way in the world he should have known this unless God revealed it to him. So I went back into, his, into that room, and I said, what else did God say? He says, that's all he told me. Do you want to talk about it? I went outside, and I talked to God about it. And God says, you made a vow to me. I kept my end of the bargain. Now you keep yours. How many of you know that day I quit smoking weed? Because he says, if you don't pay me, I'll put you back into that concrete whale, Jonah. Vows, God will hold you to that vow. Numbers 32 says, if a man makes a vow to the Lord or squares an oath to bind himself by some agreement, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. We will do whatever comes out of our mouth. We will come to him. He will bring us. He is in control. And that's exactly what happened with Jonah. Jonah made a vow to, to be a preacher for God, and God held him to that. He's a God of another chance, thank God, because he came back to Jonah in, the, in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. The last time Jonah was given this instruction, he tried to run from the presence of God. This time he did what he was told, and he went physically and emotionally and preached the shortest message I ever heard. Forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Imagine that. You've got 40 days to change your life or you're dead. You don't got a year in the, in the home. You ain't got a year in the county jail to get your life together. You've got 40 days. Huh? That's, that is a, a message that you don't want to hear from God. Because not many people can get their act together in 40 days because they're too busy lying and conniving and thinking they can compromise. They think they can get over on God, and you can. But because of God's long suffering, because of his mercy, many of us are still here today. God knows that we are ignorant people, that we do things out of ignorance. That's why he calls us sheep. We are dumb sheep that need help. We need a shepherd. We need somebody to help us and to guide us and to teach us. That's why it's important that you get plugged into a, a God-fearing church that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. Someone that's not afraid or ashamed to share with you what you need to hear. And don't harden your heart against the word. Don't become critical and angry and say, well, who are you? Who do you think you are? You don't know me. Yes, he does know you. And it's the reason why we share this with you. Because God wants to see you in heaven, not in hell. Hell was not prepared for you. Heaven was prepared for you. It says that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I've come to give you eternal life, a blessed life, an abundant life. He wants you to have a, live in a nice place, a mansion. He says, I've gone to, I go to prepare a place for you. If it wasn't so, I wouldn't say it. He's going to prepare something much better than what hell has prepared for those angels that have fallen away from grace, fallen away from, from God. Heaven 
is prepared for us. Hell was prepared for the fallen angels. Jonah witnessed the largest altar call that I know of. 120,000 from the greatest to the least, from the king to the poorest, all fasted and traded their comfortable clothing and wore itchy sackcloth and threw ashes on their head, seeking pity and forgiveness, repenting and turning from the sins that they were committing. And the king said to all the people in Jonah 3, 9, Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster they had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. What a blessing to have a loving God. Because I would probably have been one of them people inside of Nineveh. I was one of them people. You were one of them people. They didn't know the difference between right and wrong. Between your left hand and your right hand. But God was merciful. And didn't want to see those 120,000 perish. That's why he sent Jonah to go and preach the message of salvation. And God was pleased, but Jonah was disappointed. Because God didn't destroy Israel's enemies. Although they were Israel's enemies, God didn't hold their ignorance of right and wrong against them. In 2 Peter 3.9 it says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Because there was 120,000 souls that God wanted to save that day. How many souls has God asked you to minister to? And what did you do? Did you flee? Did you shut your mouth? Or did you share the love of God with them? Don't allow your opinions or your indifferences keep you from sharing God's salvation. I know many of us, we have things against homosexuals and, and informants and, and dropouts, and different types of you know, I don't know what you hate. You might hate gang members, people like me, former gang members. You wouldn't share the love of God with me. But don't let that stop you. Just like Jonah. He didn't like Nineveh because of the people that they were. And many times we're, we're just like Jonah. All of us are. We have different opinions and different indifferences. And, that, and because of that, it changes our heart. And it keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. In Matthew 5.45 it says that God. He makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you. What reward have you? So if you have some kind of prejudice inside of you. That needs to change. I know. God is dealing with me right now. In this area. That's why I'm sharing this message. This message is for Gabriel. This is for me. But I'm sharing it with you. Because I, I go to a church. I go to a church called Abundant Living. Now the majority of that church. About 80% of it African American. And when I went to that church. I said no, I can't come here. Because of the junk God was showing me. That junk is still inside of you. All that racial prejudice that they instilled inside of you in the penitentiary is still there. That's why I want you to come to this church. I want it gone. God will send you places and, and, and make you uncomfortable and to show you things that need to change inside of your life. And that's what he's doing with me right now. I'm, in the, I'm on the potter's wheel right now, being molded. I'm being shaped. And, I'm, and I, I may not like what God is doing, but I know that he knows what he's doing. And I will one day look back and say, thank you, God, for what you've done in my life. In Isaiah 55, 8, I'm closing right here. For God's thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways his ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways higher than your ways, and God's thoughts than your thoughts. Thank God for that. That we serve a mighty God that knows all things. And he searches our hearts. And he loves you enough to discipline you and to change you. And to mold you and make you. Just allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in your life. Don't be ashamed of change. Don't be afraid of change. But go with it.
Heavenly Fathers, we come before you this afternoon, God. I thank you, Lord, for all those that are watching and, and hearing this message, Lord. I thank you that you've shared this message with me to fix me and to correct me. And I know that I'm not the only vessel out here that's all messed up, but that this world has corrupted and changed our hearts and our minds and, and, and made us into people that we're not supposed to be. But you want us to be a holy people, a, a, a new people, a new creation for you, Lord. So you have your way in our lives. Holy Spirit, you mold us and you make us. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.